self-destruction, death, and hell. And Lord, we praise you because we are not who we used to be. We're on that journey of following you to, to what you made us to be. And God, I thank you that, that in spite of all of our rebellion and all of our failure and all of our junk, that you, you look at us with eyes of love, with eyes of grace, with eyes of delight in your children as you call us to be the men and women of God that you created us to be. Father, this morning, as we gather here to celebrate the fact that we're redeemed, let us hear your voice. Let it penetrate our lives and let us be changed. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hey, I'm going to invite you to take your Bible or your Bible apps and find the book of Exodus chapter 3. Uh, Exodus chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, then uh, grab one of the Bibles in the pews around you. They look just like this one. And turn to page 59, because uh, that's where Exodus 3 is. Exodus is way at the front of the book. It's the second book in the Bible. Uh, by the way, uh, have I ever mentioned that we have Saturday services too? <laughs> I, I just, I, I don't want that to escape you, because I know that uh, some of you uh, had trouble finding a place to sit, and some of you, uh, you know, had a nice hike to get here. I just praise God it wasn't raining like the weather said, but uh, I, I can't help but uh, just mention that because we have the, the same service, uh, and uh, 4.30 is comfortably full, but there's places to sit, 6 o'clock, there's lots of room. We'd love to have you come and worship with us then so that, uh, you know, more people can hike further to get here uh, on Sunday morning, so... But we're glad you're here whenever you choose to come and worship. So uh, who likes to travel? You know, besides walking from where you park to get here. You know, what is your favorite travel destination that you have ever visited? Not one you want to go to, but where have you visited that you think, I want to go back there again. Take 10 seconds and tell your neighbor starting now. Where, you, where is it? <laughs> yeah, sounds like you guys had some good trips. Sounds like you guys want to go back. Uh, some of you are like, oh, that's good. I'm going to go there. So who in all of your travels has a story of a trip gone terribly wrong? You know, you got stranded someplace, the flight got canceled, they lost your luggage, car broke down, all that kind of stuff. In 2007, we took a, a trip to China, a mission trip, uh, teaching English in a school. And on our way back from, from this uh, town called Xichang to Beijing to fly home, we, we had a layover in a, a city called Chengdu. And because the weather was so bad, they were canceling flights left and right. And we ended up spending about 20 hours on a plane on the tarmac. And yeah, it was cool. And, uh, but the, the cool part about it was the fact that they, they actually wanted us to get off the plane and go back to the terminal. And our guide said, don't do it. Because in the terminal, all the employees had gone home. And they were just going to dump us in with like 5,000 people who wanted a flight. And there was nobody there to book flights or do anything. And they said, we may never get out of there if we go back in there. And, uh, you know, again, there was no food service and there was, no, there was nothing. And, uh, and so she just said, stay on the plane, stay on the plane, stay on the plane. So we stayed on the plane. And, and because we knew people, we called back home to the States and said, hey, can you rattle any cages? And we actually, on the plane in the middle of the night, got a call from the U.S. Embassy in Beijing. It was so cool. And... Uh, and, of course, in the morning, we were the first flight out to Beijing and caught our connecting flights and all that kind of stuff. The journey was wild, it was adventurous, and it was completely worth it. The Bible is a story of journeys. When you read it, look for the, the journeys that take place because it is a story of journey after journey after journey. It's a story uh, of the journey of man from paradise where God created us uh, to our sin and rebellion. and We got kicked out, and yet... Because of Jesus, we have salvation, and we get to return one day. It's the story of the journey of Abraham that, that God built his nation on, and he said, hey, Abraham, I want you to pack up and move to a land uh, that I'll tell you when you get there. It's the story of the Apostle Paul who met Christ while traveling to Damascus to persecute Christians, and then God anointed him, the, the apostle of the Gentiles, and sent him all over the Roman world uh, 
starting churches and teaching people about Christ. And of course, ultimately, it's the story of Jesus who left his home in heaven to come to this world to be our savior, to die on the cross, to, to be buried and rise from the dead, ascend to heaven, and his journey will be complete when he returns again to judge the living and the dead. The Bible is a story of journeys, and one common theme to all those journeys is that God is always leading his people to life. God's always leading his people to life, even when the journey is wild and unpredictable and painful. So today we're kicking off a new series called Journey to Freedom. And we're going to be looking at the Exodus event, starting in in Exodus 3 today, where God led the Israelites out of slavery, out of bondage in Egypt to become a nation that was free. So we begin our story with the call to freedom. And to kick it all off, I'd love for you to hear the story of a man who found freedom when God called him. Go ahead and watch this. Hi, my name's Ted, and this is my journey to freedom. I accepted Christ when I was about eight years old. But as I reached my teen years, I began to rebel against the legalistic Christian principles that my parents had taught me. I began to go into a rebellion process that brought me to smoking cigarettes, brought me to my first beer at age 16. And unlike so many of my friends, I really liked that first beer. At 17, I left home. And without having any accountability in my life at that point, alcohol became a bigger part of my life and I begin that 40-year journey of alcohol addiction that cost me so much. I stayed around the church for a few years to try to keep my wife happy, but the alcohol began to affect our relationship. I was struggling with emotional abuse that it was in the family with her and my sons, and she finally had enough, and after 15 years of marriage, she filed for divorce and took my children and moved to the state of Washington. I entered into a second marriage that led to a second divorce, all alcohol-related again but I was, wasn't struggling with the issue of being an alcoholic because I wasn't an alcoholic. I didn't drink at work. I could quit if I wanted to. I just didn't want to quit. And besides, I really liked the taste of beer. That journey down the path of destruction caused by the alcohol in my life was impacting every area of my life by this time. I entered into a third marriage. I'd seen this girl sitting in the bar when I'd stopped to make a bar check before I got off duty at the police department. That night I returned to the bar and a year later we were married. But once again, it was an alcohol-related marriage, and the struggles that come with alcohol permeated our marriage. We we fought, we had struggles. Most of what we did was alcohol-related, and our beer tab was growing faster than the national debt. In 1997, as a result of the alcohol-induced depression, I tried to take my own life. During this time, my wife and I continued to struggle. And for whatever reason, she decided to stay with me. I don't know what her, what she saw, what she had in mind, but she stayed with me through all of these struggles and through all of the fights. In 1998, we moved to Lake Havasu. And at the prompting of my wife, we started looking for a church to attend. And on a Sunday morning in November of 1998, we found this place called Calvary. And that changed my life forever. At Calvary, I found this life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. Out of that relationship came a healthy, Christ-centered marriage, a growing relationship with my sons and a daughter and their families, and also a peace that I had never felt in my life. And it was that peace that I found, that relationship that I found, that began that journey to sobriety and to freedom from my addiction. In 2005, I was one of the startup ministry leaders for Celebrate Recovery. And through Celebrate Recovery, I've had the privilege of seeing God work miracles in the lives of more people than I can count as they turned their lives over to Christ and walked away from their addictions into the freedom that Christ offers. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the plans I have for you, declared the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to hurt you, plans to give you hope and a future. In spite of all my misery, in spite of all my dysfunction, in spite of my addictions, God had a plan for my future. My name is Ted. I'm a grateful follower of Jesus Christ. And today I celebrate 14 years of freedom from my addiction to alcohol. What a great story of how God calls us to freedom. 
So today, uh, we're beginning our story with the call to freedom. Uh, a little bit of background as we pick up Exodus 3. Uh, the Israelites have been in Egypt for 400 years. They moved there during a time of famine. Joseph was uh, second in command in Egypt, and so they had favored status. And, and they stayed there and stayed there. And over the years, uh, Pharaoh came up. He didn't know Joseph. And the Israelites moved from favored status to slave status. And, and they began crying out to God, and God answers them by calling Moses. Pick up Exodus chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. It says, Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then God said, do not come near, take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, and Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. The journey to freedom begins when we realize that God calls us. God calls us. Did you notice that God called Moses by name? He, he said, Moses, come here and talk to me. He didn't go, hey, shepherd guy. Hey, anybody out there wandering in the wilderness? Hey, come over here. I want to talk to somebody. No, he said, Moses. I want to talk to you. And it's kind of cool that God spoke out of a burning bush, isn't it? I mean, he's never spoken to me out of a burning bush. And in fact, in all of the Bible, he only does this one time. And, and so it's not normal that God would speak to any of us out of a burning bush. It is normal that God calls us. Every one of us. Because if you are a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then you know that God calls you because you've already answered that call. You've said yes to Jesus. You said, I surrender my life to you and, and, and you're my Lord. You've said yes. You've heard that call from God and maybe you heard it as a still small voice, just in the quiet of your heart, just something saying, yes, I believe and I'm gonna follow or maybe you had a dramatic life-altering moment where suddenly God became real to you and you said, that is my path and I'm on it. Or maybe, like Ted, you heard God speak to you and you hit bottom. In your despair and in your brokenness, you finally paid attention. Or maybe you just kind of grew up hearing God's voice. You were in church, you were around people who believed and, and it just was natural for you to kind of go, yeah, that's God, I, I get that, I hear him doesn't really matter how. What matters is that you heard God call you and you said yes. And today I want you to realize that God is still calling us. He's still calling you. And, and, and the truth is we don't always listen. You know, a lot of times we're just too busy. We're focused on our world, our things that we want to do. Sometimes we're just distracted or sometimes we're not interested in what God has to say. So God is calling us. Today, are you listening? Are you listening? See, God called Moses from a burning bush. God called the prophet Samuel as a voice in the night. God called Isaiah in a direct encounter in the temple. God told Jeremiah he called him before he was even born. He called Paul out of a blinding light and a thundering voice. He appeared to Joseph in a dream. He spoke to Mary by an angel. God calls every one of us in different ways at different times. Are we listening? Because God calls us and God qualifies us. Look, God's calling someone right now. <laughs> wow, be careful how you answer that one. Man, that would be so cool, wouldn't it? No, in my luck, I'd hit the wrong button and hang up on him. Then we go, is God going to call again? <laughs> yes, he is. God calls us. And when God calls us, God qualifies us as well. 
God qualifies us. I want to pick up the story in verse 10 of uh, Exodus 3. God's talking. He says, come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? And God said, but I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. If God calls you, then God will equip you. He will give you the strength, the talent, the wisdom, the resources to follow him and do whatever it is he asks you to do. You see, God's calling isn't dependent on our skills or our abilities or our past successes or failures. God's calling is dependent on him. And guess what? God is able. He is able. Moses was not qualified in his own eyes. Did you catch what he said in verse 11? Who am I? Who am I that I should go? I'm not ready to do this. Truth is, God had been preparing Moses for this day his entire life. And by the way, Moses is 80 years old. See, he grew up in the household of Pharaoh, and so he knew the ins and outs of the government, how it worked and who the people were. And he'd been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years where God was going to have him lead the children of Israel out into. He knew his way around the desert and how to survive. God had been preparing Moses before he even called Moses. Isn't that cool? God's been preparing you for whatever task it is that he's calling you to. Because God calls us and God qualifies us. So Moses goes, I'm not qualified. And he starts coming up with excuses. I know we would never do that to God, but here's what Moses does. First of all, Moses goes, I don't know who you are. So who are you, God? Who are you? Verse 13 of of Exodus 3. Then Moses says to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What do I say? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel, the I am has sent me to you. I am. God reveals his name to Moses and through Moses to us. God reveals himself. He says, tell them that the living God, the I am, the one who exists, the one who is real, has sent you to them. And so Moses hears God, and then he goes, okay, so uh, in in chapter 4, verse 1, what if they don't believe me? What if they don't believe me? And he says that. Moses answered, but behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say, the Lord didn't appear to you. Right? Because he ever told someone that God told you something? They kind of look at you like, you're crazy? That's what Moses is afraid. He says, they're, they're, they're not going to listen to me. They're not going to say, God didn't appear to you. And, and so God does something that is so cool that I'm a little bit envious of Moses. He gives Moses superpowers. He really does. You check out the story, he does this. He gives him special powers so that people will believe that God sent him. First of all, he goes, Moses, what do you have in your hand? And Moses is holding on to his staff. He's a shepherd. It's my staff. Throw it down. Well, I kind of like my staff, God. Why don't we get, throw it down. So Moses throws the staff down, and it becomes a snake. <laughs> cool, but not cool, right? <laughs> His staff is now a snake, and, and Moses is a little bit freaked out by that, and God says, then, uh, pick it up. <laughs> yeah, let me cut its head off first, right? He says, pick it up. Moses picks up the snake, and it becomes a staff. <laughs> Guys, that's cool. I can't do that. And if you can do that, Yeah, I don't think so. And and then, if that's not enough, he says, take some water and pour it out. And and water, when Moses pours it out, becomes blood. That's gross and cool, you know, because you can't do that either. Wouldn't want him serving drinks at the refreshment, you know, would you? Want a glass of blood? Yeah, anyway. So he turns water into blood. And then, as if that's not enough, he says, Moses, take your hand and put it inside your cloak. And Moses does that. He says, take it out. And it turned leprous diseased, and Moses was like, I don't like this one, God. (laughs) Put it back into your cloak. Take it out, and it's healed. So God gives Moses these signs, these these powers, so that he can show people, hey, look, God has sent me to you. So that doesn't really convince Moses either, because in verse 10 he says, "Uh, God, I can't speak well. But Moses said to the Lord, oh, my Lord, I'm not eloquent, either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I'm slow of speech and of tongue. 
Moses goes, God, I'm defective. I, I can't do this. I'm not able to do this. I don't have the skills to do this. And listen to God's response. I love this. Verse 11, God says, the Lord said to him, um, who has made man's mouth? It's not a trick question. Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now, therefore, go and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. So Moses says, I'm defective. And God says, I can fix you. You you don't have the skills, you don't have the ability because I'm calling you, I am equipping you, I am qualifying you, and I will fix your mouth so that you can speak. As if that's not enough at this point. Moses has one more excuse. He simply goes, I don't want to go. I don't want to. Pick up verse 13. But Moses said, Oh, my Lord, please send someone else. That's not dignified. God is talking to you out of a burning bush. He told you his name. He gave you superpowers. And I don't want to go. Why doesn't Moses want to go? Well, maybe because he's old. He's 80 years old. And God is calling him to do this amazing thing, which ought to be a lesson to us that we don't ever... Stop serving God. There's not a retirement written about in Scripture. Actually, there is. But you guys know what God calls retirement? Yeah, death. Death. You retire when you can't breathe in this world anymore. And then guess what? You don't actually retire. You just get to go to heaven and serve God there. See, we're servants of God. And and God says, Moses, I want you to go. Moses is thinking, I'm old and I'm tired. I don't want to do this. And God says, I'm calling you. you, You're unqualified. You can do this. And and maybe Moses was just comfortable. I don't want to do it. I've got a routine. I get up. I take the sheep out. It's all good. And, And God says, I don't care about your comfort. I've got a task for you. Maybe Moses is afraid. He's thinking, I'm wanted for murder in Egypt. If I go back there, they're going to throw me in jail. They're going to kill me. Or maybe he's thinking, I don't want to risk failing. What if I can't do this? What if I I go and I fall on my face? And, And whatever his excuse of not wanting to go in the end, Moses obeys God. He did what he was called by God to do because when God calls us, God qualifies us. Always. So God is calling us. God is calling you. What excuses are you trying to use? See, the truth is, none of us is qualified. None of us is worthy to serve the living God. And yet, God invites us to join him on this journey to freedom. No excuses accepted. And honestly, we need more of you to say yes to God's call. We talk about the, the mission of Christ here at, at Calvary, and we have identified there are thirty five to 40,000 unchurched people in Lake Havasu City. And we believe this is our mission field and that God is going to use this church to impact those people who right now don't even want to go to church, don't even believe in God, don't care. And if we're going to do that, then we need your help because here's what's happening, guys, and it's good news. We're building a, a building. It's a little bit bigger than this one, better parking than this one. But it's not for us. It's for people who haven't yet come here. And we need your help. If we're going to reach them, if we're going to make a difference in their lives, then we need some of you to say yes. You know, let me just tell you some of the things that we need. Because God's calling some of you right now. We need, we need life group leaders. Right now, we have 37 life groups with over 400 people involved in, in Bible study in people's homes throughout the week. And that is really cool because a couple of years ago, we had zero and now we got 37. You go, that's really cool. But if, guess what? If God's going to send hundreds more people to get to know him, we need more life groups right now. We need more life groups. And some of you are sitting here and you're in life groups. and You're going, life groups are cool. I love my life group. And yet God's been poking you and saying, you need to lead a life group. You need to call Pastor Chet tomorrow and repent and just say, hey, God told me. And there's some of you who aren't in a life group, but you're perfectly qualified to lead a life group because you've done it other places before and you've got the maturity, you've got the understanding, you've got the people skills to do it, and, and, and you just haven't done it. And tomorrow you need to call Pastor Chad or email him and just say, hey, you know what? God spoke to me and I need to lead a life group. And we need people to work with children. Have you guys noticed that we have kids? 
We got lots of kids. We got like 170 to 200 children a weekend here at Calvary. And that is so cool. And that is so awesome. And that number is going to grow when we move. And we're going to need more people to help out and volunteer and, and, and be part of the children's ministry. And it's so cool. And you don't have to do it like every week. Uh, or you can if you want to. But we just need you to help. And some of you know that God's calling you to do that. And we need some of you to help out in tech ministry. You know, because right now we've got sound and we've got computer. And it's really cool and you like the fact that they do it and they do it really well. But when we build the new building, we're going to have sound and computer and lights and video. And we're going to need more of you. And there are some of you sitting here that are so tech savvy that it's sick. And you love technological toys and you're able to do this. And, and honestly, we need you to say, hey, God, I hear you and I'm going to do this. And there's so many other areas of service. But here's the truth. We need all of us to just simply care about our friends and invite our friends. Say, hey, can I lead you to a life-changing relationship with Jesus? Can I be a part in, in making a difference in your life? And you can say, I can't do that. I'm not qualified. But the truth is, God qualifies us when he calls us. And some of you know God's calling you to serve in an area. Say yes, he'll qualify you. And some of you know that God is calling you to leave a life of captivity today. And God will make it possible. You've already heard the story of one man whose life was changed when he said yes to the call of God. So God calls us and God qualifies us. And God's purpose is freedom. God's purpose is freedom. Flip back to chapter 3 and pick up in verse 7. This is right after Moses has encountered God at the bush. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry Because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. And to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land. A land that is flowing with milk and honey. To the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now behold the cry of the people of Israel has come to me. And I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. So come. Come. I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. God's desire is to set his people free. You get that? Free from slavery and oppression, free from the destruction of sin and death and hell. He he wants to set us free. This was the purpose of Moses, to set the children of Israel free. We just read that in verse 10. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Moses, this is your task. This is your calling. This is what I want you to do. Set my people free. But this was also the purpose of Jesus. It's why he came. In the Gospel of Luke, the fourth chapter, Jesus is talking and he's quoting the prophet Isaiah and he says this, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind. To set at liberty those who are oppressed. Jesus said, I have come to set the captives free. To set the captives free. And guess what, folks? We're the prisoners. We're the ones who are enslaved by our sin, our self-destructive desires, our addictions, our habits, our patterns of life that are killing us. And Jesus' death and resurrection broke the chains that held us. And when we follow Jesus, we step into that journey of freedom. Jesus came to set us free. That's his purpose. And guess what? It's our purpose. Freedom is our purpose. First of all, to walk in the the journey of freedom. To say yes to Jesus and to know that our sins are forgiven and that heaven is our destination. But it doesn't end there. Then our purpose is to live free in Christ. To live free in Christ. The Apostle Paul, who knew something about slavery and freedom, in Galatians 5 says this. This is so cool. Listen to this. For freedom, Christ has set us free. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. God wants us to live free as his sons and daughters. 
And we know that, and yet so often we stumble again, and we fall back into captivity, and we fall back into the old patterns, and and we carry that shame and that guilt with us, and yet God is simply calling us out of the pit. He can lift you out of the pit and set your feet back on solid ground, and you can follow him and live in freedom once again. That's his power to do that. And then finally, not only are we to walk the journey of freedom and live free in Christ, but, but our purpose is to lead others to freedom. To lead others to freedom. God is calling us out of our slavery and then to lead others out of their slavery as well. And you don't have to be a pastor or a deacon or anybody, you know, spiritual leadership to do this. Whether you serve God as a doctor or a nurse or a teacher or an accountant, a mechanic or a truck driver, stay-at-home mom, a police officer, a fireman, it doesn't matter. However you're serving God, you have influence and you can lead people to Jesus. That's why this church exists, to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. We're on a journey. It is wild. It is unpredictable. Sometimes it's even painful. But it is a journey to freedom. And it is so worth the trip. So are you living in captivity? Or are you on the journey to freedom? The amazing thing is God gives us the choice. But today... He's calling you to freedom. Will you pray with me? Father, it is amazing that you love us the way that you do. That you sent your son into this world to rescue us and to to call us out of captivity, out of slavery, and into a life of freedom, a life of blessing, a life of hope. And Lord, I know there's some here today that that haven't yet taken that step of faith uh, of saying, I'm gonna trust Jesus, I'm gonna follow him with my life. I pray, God, today they would hear your voice and they would take that step. Lord, there's some here today that that know you, but they've been living in captivity, even though they don't have to. And I pray that today would be the beginning of that journey to following you back into freedom. Lord, lift them up out of the pit. Give them that hope, that understanding that you can set them free. And Father, there are some here today that their hearts are burdened as they hear your voice calling them to make a difference in the lives of their family and their friends. So Lord, let us hear your voice. And today, without excuses, let us say yes to this journey of freedom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's stand and continue worshiping our God.